I forgot which nine I preached, but whatever nine I preached, this is what I preached. I preached these four points. It's all that I preached. So you're going to hear the expanded version. But even with the expanded version, there's still quite a bit that I did not cover and I will not even cover today. The Word of God is amazingly um, equipped with many different teachings about the use of the Lord's treasury. And not only that, I have read, and I can't prove it to be very frank with you, but I read from a gentleman who wrote one time, one out of every six verses in the Bible has a reference in one way or another to money. If that be true, or anywhere close to being true, that's quite amazing. That's quite amazing. But I do know for a fact, the Bible has a lot to say about money, about finances your personal finances, and the finances of the church. We're going to be focusing in more specifically this morning on the contribution to the church treasury. We're going to forego proving and establishing a long part of our lesson on the importance of contributing. We're going to begin at that point and move forward. I'm going to give everybody here credit to understand it is a duty it should be an honor, a privilege for all New Testament Christians to lay by and store. We will notice a passage that is read frequently when the brother uh, passes the contribution. He'll make a few comments, and we will read a couple of passages along that line. But we're going to basically spend our time on how to spend the church treasury. There's a lot of controversy in the religious world today about the money that is gathered by a variety of religious organizations. But being that these religious organizations started by man, man has come up with all kinds of ways to spend their money. We're not interested in man's church, nor the way man chooses to spend their money. We're interested today in the Lord's church and how the Lord wants us to spend his money. The money that's gathered by the saints to be utilized in an appropriate way. I am confident today many individuals would make bad decisions on how to use the church treasury. I'm also confident today that many people, many congregations even, have utilized and spent the contribution in a way that should not have been spent. We need to be careful. Making sure that we obeyed the Lord's will referred to the church treasury as much as out of the singing, prayer, teaching, communion, and then obviously the contribution. The contribution was mentioned even in the book of Acts, the second chapter, and verse 42. When the word of God teaches in Acts 2, the day the church was established, the first gospel sermon that was ever preached that people had the opportunity to obey it said, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. This word fellowship is from the same word whereby we get contribution. And it's very important that we understand today, the Lord has an opinion. The Lord has his divine will. And we today are privileged to be a member of the Lord's church and we should be very eager and very willing to submit unto his way. Okay, let's look at the four ways that the Bible clearly, without any doubt at all, mentions how the money should be spent. And then we will go further to some related passages. And then the concluding remarks, as time permit, we will go into a third division of our lesson. Number one, the contribution should be spent for needed saints. This is the very popular passage here in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. If you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn. As I normally do, I'll be reading and preaching from the King James Version. Now here in 1 Corinthians, it is just right off the bat, Paul said, now concerning. You know, there are se several different topics that Paul addressed in the Corinthian letter, now concerning spiritual gifts. Now concerning one thing after another, but now concerning the collection. He's given divine inspiration, and here it is. Verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints. As I've given order to the churches of Galatia, 
even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. Now let us take a good look at this situation here. Now concerning the collection for the saints, we've called it church treasury. It could equally be called collection. Many times you say, would you mind taking care of the collection this morning as a brother who waits on the table and then he will also go into another item of worship not connected to the communion service, but also he will take care of the collection. So this gathering of funds in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it's called the collection. For who? For the saints. Collection for the saints. Now this is going to be a very important part of today's lesson. I'm going to make a statement, and you may want to second guess it at first, and if you continue to second guess it, let's talk about it. I want you to really think about this. This collection, this gathering of financial funds, as people lay by in store, as God has prospered them, is not for people in the world. It is not from people who are not members of the Lord's church. The Word of God said it is for the saints. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand the saints are the will of the children of God. This is according to the will of God. Now, does that mean we should have no concern for those who are in the community who needs help? Not at all. We should be very concerned and we should do everything within our power to aid and to assist individually out of our pockets those who we choose to help. But the contribution, the collection, the church treasury is not designed by God to feed the world. This is going to become abundantly clear throughout the lesson today. I'll give you several book chapter verses to show you that the gathering of the financial means of the church is to be spent on New Testament Christians. Now this is true whether in this congregation, whether there's a national a disaster and Christians in different parts of the country need help, it's fine to send money to aid and to assist them. We'll show you that also. Or even around the world. I mentioned at the 4th of July meeting at both Sulphur and Springfield that the churches in America raised over $1 million to aid and to assist a famine that hit Africa a number of years ago. Several corrected me and let me know it was closer to $2 million. That is a great blessing that brothers and sisters reached out to people that they would never see, they would never meet. Just a very handful of Americans will ever see these nice and wonderful men and women of God. But from America, we were able to send approximately or nearly $2 million to offer aid and assistance to our brothers and our sisters in Africa during a time of famine. <laughs> Several people mentioned that to me at the Springfield meeting, and I said, that is a great, great amount. I had others to mention it before, even between self and there. And, and this is very important. I just want you to know, whenever you lay by in store, however much that within your heart that you give as you're prospered, and as you give as you purpose in your heart, and you give not grudgingly nor in necessity, and all those magnificent passages, understand you can be putting food in one of your fellow Christians' mouth. You can be offering finances that will eventually help to buy clothing, shelter, and whatever other necessities of life. The Word of God is very quick to point out the need of saints. In this segment of our lesson, I've chosen to only give one passage under each of these four. Now, when we talk about these related scriptures, you'll see others that you could also put over here. But I want to make it clear and precise on how to use, how to scripturally spend the church treasury, and that is for needed saints. Now, I want all Christians within the congregation here, but as well as all Christians wherever you're from, to understand a needed saint 
He's not one to make their elaborate lifestyle because they've hit a, a lull in their financial resources. It's not that. A needed saint is one who is a member of the body of Christ who's having difficulty taking care of his uh, family, whether it be food, clothing, shelter, or a medical need or something of this nature. This is very, very important. Brethren may, may make decisions that other people in other congregations may not make. That's very common these days, and I understand that. Different brethren will know a situation better than other people will. But I will promise you one thing. The eldership at 21st Street is committed to following the New Testament teaching on how to scripturally use the contribution. This is very important. More will be said along this line throughout the lesson. Number two, to support the preaching of the gospel. You know, the Apostle Paul made this abundantly clear. No one can read 2 Corinthians 11 chapter and verse 8 and draw any other conclusion than the finances are to be spent to help the preaching of the gospel. You know, the Apostle Paul said the following. He said, I have robbed other churches. <laughs> I took wages of them to do you service. I reached out and received support from Congregation A to help you at Congregation B. They supported me to help you. And this is somewhat common in America and other countries as well. There are times that congregations, for example, might need a gospel meeting. They may need some local work done. And congregation will together send money directly to the preacher and they will support him financially to carry on a special work. But also there are the variety of ways that the preacher and the gospel is done. You remember Paul had three different missionary journeys that were recorded in scripture. There's a great uh, number of examples of people in the word of God who are receiving financial assistance from the church. The, the great men who are gospel preachers and today, that continues. And this is very, very important. And this is according to the Lord's will. You know, when Paul said, I have robbed other churches, we're not talking about something illegal here. He simply said, I've taken money, financial resources. I've taken support, a term that we're more accustomed to today. I've taken support from this congregation to help you at this congregation. Most preachers, if not all preachers, would equally treat this matter the same. You know, there have been times in my preaching, as well as other gospel preachers, that brethren say, listen, we would love to have you for a gospel meeting, or we would love to have a gospel meeting even, but we're not able to financially support it. We're not even able to help pay the travel expenses, etc." And that happens, but you never, a preacher would never let money stop them from going and preaching the gospel. They're committed to preaching the gospel. And whatever extent they need to do this, they're willing to do it. But on the other hand of that, there's also brethren and sisters and congregations who will, are very generous in their support to make sure that this preacher has the opportunity to go out and help others and he will have his bases covered financially. Understand this. The contribution that you support that you lay by in store on the first day of every week will go to helping the needed saints and help the support of the preaching of the gospel. This is so very important. And today, it should become part of your regular routine budget, if you would, that you understand that it is my duty as a New Testament Christian. But not only a duty, a duty sounds like I've got to. But it, you do, but you need to do it out of a loving and a gracious heart. The Lord said, don't give grudgingly. Don't give of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. So if you can't give cheerfully and you give grudgingly, might as well keep it as far as doing you and spiritual good. The Lord doesn't like that. But it's very important today that we grow to the point that we're eager and excited to lay by in store on the first day of the week. And if you're reading a modern version, you'll see it will say every week. Lay by in store every week. There in 1 Corinthians 16. 
And you know, in our way, we're helping the spread of the gospel. Now, this is important for our young people to understand. You young adults in our assembly today, as if the Lord lets the world to rock on, you may find yourself in a variety of places to live throughout your lifetime. And it's very important for you to know when I contribute and have confidence in your leadership that that money will be spent in an appropriate way. And it's important for you to know these are the four ways to our young men, young adults. It's important for you to be able to stand up and give the congregation that you're working with, the congregation you're associated with, the you worship with on the Lord's Day, that you call your home church, maybe in, even in the absence of elders and deacons, or even without the absence of an evangelist, that you be able to point out book, chapter, and verse, these four points. Because this is how to scripturally spend the church treasure. All right, a widow indeed. In 1 Timothy 5, we're going to note verse 3, and also verse 9 and 10. As a matter of fact, point three and four are both taken from 1 Timothy 5. So if you would, turn with me to 1 Timothy 5, we would take a look at what Paul was telling the young preacher, Timothy. As Timothy was being trained by the apostle Paul, Paul had several things he needed to tell Timothy, and then the next book being Titus, or after 2 Timothy is Titus, Paul teaches them, as he did other younger preachers, how to do the work. In 1 Timothy 5, notice verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. If you have a different version than King James, you'll have a different wording at this particular point. But we're going to call it widows indeed. A woman who's lost her husband. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Now verse 9, now listen, you may not know this. You may have heard it, but maybe you haven't retained it. I want you to retain this information today. It is scriptural. It is biblically based that if a woman falls under the realm of a widow indeed, she can be financially supported by the congregation on a regular and a continuing basis. Did you get that? That a widow financially can be supported by the church on a regular and a continuing basis if the need remains, if she meets the qualification laid forth in verses 9 and 10. Would you look at your Bible as I read verses 9 and 10? The Bible says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Verse 10, Well reported of for good works, if she's brought up children, if she's lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. Now, in order for the person to be in this category, it's very clear that the Bible said if they're a widow under 60 years old, a score is 20 years. Here it says three score years. So it's 60 years old. So a woman who's 59 and a half does not qualify for a continuing financial support of a congregation. Now we may want to use human reasoning as to why she should, but we cannot do that. We cannot change one letter of the word of the Lord. God knew exactly what he was doing here. He has spoken of three score and ten as far as the common age of 70 or by reason of strength four score for people. My dear friends right here he said three score years, 60 years old. Take another look at that verse 9. They're 60 years old having been the wife of one man. That is this woman should be scripturally, have been scripturally married. She obviously now is a widow. She is scripturally has been scripturally married. She's been the wife of one man. You know, this is very important today. And in our day and time, to be very frank with you, it's going to be hard to find some congregation that have a woman who's been the wife of one man. But that's what the Bible said. I didn't make it up. 
That's in the Word of God, in your Bible, that you're holding in your lap, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 9. More I can say on that, but I'll go to verse 10. Well reported of for good works. Now understand, a woman who might be 60 years old, she might be the wife of one man, but she can't wake up one day and say, hey, I, I want to fit this category. I will start now doing good. No, this has got to be her pattern of life and her way of life. She's well reported of. It is common knowledge that this lady, this sister in the faith, is a good, godly Christian woman. This is very, very important. It is one thing to start your life over and to start afresh and do the best you can. And that's great. We love that. We need that. Men and women, we need that. However, to be brought under the financial assistance of the church on a regular and a continuing basis, they will continue to meet these qualifications. If she's brought up children, some will say, oh, if she doesn't have children, it's really not a big deal. It may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to God. Now understand, it's not up to us to make the rules here, the qualifications. That's not my job. That's not your job. It's not my job to make a rule. It's not my job to break a rule. You've heard it said of me before. It's just as wrong to be a lawmaker as it is to be a lawbreaker. And this is very important. The Lord is very specific here in how to handle this situation. If she has lodged strangers, she's been a hospitable person. It is a part of every New Testament Christian to be hospitable, to accept, the Bible even calls them strangers, into your home. This is the way a Christian home is run, that your, your doors are open to help fellow Christians, the apostles, the early travelers, the New Testament preachers, even men who are not apostles. You know, there would be nothing uncommon for them to be welcomed into the home of someone. It wasn't even uncommon for Jesus to invite himself home with you. He did in Luke 19 to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is up in a tree so he could see Jesus. And Jesus got on that tree and said, Zacchaeus, come out of that tree. I'm going home with you. So it's nothing uncommon here for Jesus to invite himself home with you. Well, we see now the Lord does have guidelines that must be followed. It went on to say, if she's washed the saints' feet. Again, part of her hospitality here, washing the saints' feet, providing a situation for cleanliness here and hospitality here. You know, washing the saints' feet is addressed in John 13 a number of years ago. We studied that, and we promise to study it with you again. But um, washing the saints' feet and the holy kiss were two key areas that people at times have um, quite a bit of interest about, and we're very happy to discuss that with you at the appropriate time. If she has relieved the afflicted, if in her lifetime of 60 years, she's been one that's aided and assisted others, then she now can receive aid and assistance from the church. So we're beginning to understand, women, you have a very viable part of your work in a congregation. It's very important that you do what you can do. We have, all have limitations. Women have limitations, what they can do during the public assembly. But outside the assembly, we need to understand men and women alike have responsibilities they're to take care of. If she has diligently followed every good work. Dear friends, a Christian woman is priceless. Just like a Christian man is priceless. You can't put a dollar amount on the value of a Christian man or woman because he or she can lead people to the gospel by the life that they live, by their good influence, by their light that they shine forth into a dark world. It's very important that we understand. Supporting the preaching gospel, helping the widows in need, and now you see three different ways the Bible has illustrated that we utilize the Lord's money. Support elders. Point number four, support elders. This is not a requirement to support elders, but it's to let us know 
that it is scripture to do so if a situation warrants it. In 1 Timothy 5, would you go in down verse 17, verse 18, and we'll address that. Now, the Bible is very clear. There's no second guessing at this point. I don't know that I've ever had anybody to second guess it, but I wanted to be clear and precise in what it is that needs to be addressed here. Verse 17, 1 Timothy 5, the Bible says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. Double honor is your key phrase here. Double honor is one honor is love, honor, respect that you show toward them. An elder deserves that as being men who qualify, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualification of an elder. But secondly, within that double honor, is financial support. Financial support for a man who has given himself, as the Bible said here in verse 17, notice here, to word and to doctrine. This is so important. You know an elder of a congregation, one of the uniqueness between an elder and a deacon is an elder has to be a, a teacher, and that is a public teacher. Deacons don't have to teach at all. We're blessed here that our teachers are all, uh, that our deacons are all teachers. All five of them are teachers in the, in the church, but it's fine. And I've ordained deacons in congregation who had never taught before and probably never will. But that's fine because that wasn't required of them. However, with an elder, that is required of them. The Bible says they're to be apt to teach. It's very important that this be taken into consideration. Now, more we can say on that, but let me read into the record these four points again. How to scripturally spend the church treasury? These four points are very important. For the needed saints, to support the preaching of the gospel, for the widows indeed, and for the support of the eldership. That is biblically based. Now, if you know a fifth point, I'm more than happy to hear it. As long as you give me a good old book, chapter, and verse in the Bible, I'll put number five on here the next time I preach this particular lesson. It's very important that we not think like men, but we think like God and from God's word when regarding this matter. Because what happens is emotions get into it. Many times family gets into it. Your family, you know, your, your loyalty to your family or friendship gets into it. And people begin to make bad decisions based on uh, relationships and then they do book, chapter, and verse. We are a book, chapter, and verse congregation. We want everybody to know when you lay by in the store that the financial resources of the congregation, this is how they'll be spent. Okay, much more to be said. Let's look at these related passages. I'm not going to be able to go into detail on all of this tonight or this morning. But I want to read this into the record. Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 31 through 46. And Mark 9, verse 41. Also at 6, verse 1 through 6. Also verse chapter 11, the book of Acts. Acts 11, 27 through 30. Also at Romans 15, verse 25 and 26. Also, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4. And then Galatians 6 and 10. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 and 18. James 2, verse 14 and 17. Now, this is only a drop of the bucket of passages that will help us identify individual responsibility and the responsibility of the local congregation. Two important categories. Individual responsibility, like if you choose to help a, a gentleman or a lady who's on the street corner holding up a sign, that's an individual choice. It's not the work of the church to do that. But the local congregation is to help these needed saints. Everything fits together very, very well when you let God's word set forth the standard of which we make decisions. Would you look with me, please? In Matthew 25. Now 31 through 46 is a very popular passage to be used when we talk about end times. The last days. When the world comes to an end. The separating of the sheep from the goats. Those on the right hand, those on the left. That's all well and that's all good. But that's not my point in using this passage. 
I want you to look with me at Matthew 25. And let's keynote verse 40 and verse 45. Those are the only two verses I'm going to be pointing out at this segment of this lesson. In Matthew 25, verse 40, The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these mine, listen now, brethren, you've done it unto me. Because you offered assistance in time of need to a brother in Christ, you've done it to me. So realize, whenever we reach a helping hand to a brother, the Lord said, you're doing it to me. Verse 45, Then shall he answer and say, Verily I say unto you, And as much as you did it not, that's just the opposite now, 180 degree different, you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. You forwent, you did not help someone who needed your help. Jesus said, Because you didn't help them, you didn't help me. That's the way the Lord looks at it. Now you can look at that in any translation you want to, and you're going to get the same message. We have a responsibility, the word is stand up and do what we can. Mark 9, verse 41. And Mark 9, verse 41, that very popular passage about someone giving a cup of cold water in the Lord's name. In Mark 9, 41, For whosoever shall give a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he should not lose his reward. The Lord knows when you do that. You know, we have all struggled. Every one of us, I have no doubt in my mind, have struggled with, you know, a lot. I almost said every, but a lot of four-way stops, signal lights, and you stop, and there are people on every corner with signs up. Variety of messages, put of signs up. And you're trying to think, what do I do? And even to the point that we feel a little bit guilty at times for not helping. Now I'm telling you, I know that for a fact. I've had many people across America talk to me about that, and I've even talked to myself about it. What am I going to do? Well, my wife has a one solution to that, and she's helped me with that. And um, I'm, I'm long, quite some time back, she used to keep an eye chest, and maybe this summer now she probably will, and put cold water in. A bottle of water. And then at least when you're there, you give them a cup of cold water in the Lord's name. And let them know you're willing to help in this way. And I've never had my turn down bottled water. And at least you have a passage that talks about water, a cup of cold water in the Lord's name. But I do realize that the cup of cold water is also a, just a, one of a small matter that you could help. But sometimes it is kind of guilt filling knowing what to do. But let me tell you something today. Let us maintain this. Individually, it's up to you to make the decision whether you're going to help or not. That's your choice. Congregationally, it's up to the Lord to decide how we're going to do it. And these four ways are the way to do it. Okay, let's look at the book of Acts, the sixth chapter. This is one of those rare times that I'm going to go a little longer than I normally go on Sunday morning, so uh, don't get your invitation to the song book out yet. Okay. In Acts 6, chapter, there were neglected widows. These neglected widows, there was a little murmuring, a little confusion going on here. And they were complaining our widows are being neglected. And a quite an interesting conversation took place here between the apostles and those who are complaining. They never said, your complaint is not worthy. No, not in your life. They said, we need this is the problem. You brought it to our attention, and we appreciate that, and we're going to give you a solution to that problem. Would you look with me at Acts 6, 1 through 4? This is a very important role because this shows problem, solution. This shows you when a situation comes up, you figure the biblical solution, and you deal with it. Acts 6, 1 through 4. In those days, when the number of the disciples multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we shall leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, 
whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles said, listen, it's not reasonable that we just can quit preaching and go take care of the needed, neglected widow. We're not going to do that. That's not reasonable. But what is reasonable is that you look out among you, find seven men he chose. He said, who meet these qualifications, and then we'll appoint them over this business, and the matter will be taken care of. Dear friends, always look to the word of the Lord for solutions to problems that we encounter. And you will find it most times. Okay, I must hasten. Acts 11, chapter, a very interesting situation. Acts 11, 27 through 30. And this is a classic case of the financial resources of the church going to help people in a dire need. They had a problem. Acts 11, 27 to 30. I'm going to only read 28 and 29. There stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout the world. Get hold of that. Don't forget our topic. There can be a drought throughout the world. Which came to pass in the day of the Claudius Caesar. Verse 29. Then the disciples, every man, listen now, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto who? The brethren which dwelt in Judea. There was a drought in all the world. Member of the church? Not member of the church. There was a drought in all the world. However, the relief here was sent to the brethren to help. So you see the congregation will help the brethren and individually you can help anybody you want. We've established that before. But from the church treasury, this is a great passage to prove the point that needs to be. Look at Romans, same thing. I'm going to give you these and then I'll uh, begin to look toward the conclusion. Go with me to the next passage, which is the next book of the book of Romans. Romans 15th chapter. Verses 25 and 26. You're going to identify here poor saints. Poor saints who need help. The Bible said, But now I go into Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased them in Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. Dear friends, when poor saints need help, congregations should be more than happy to aid and to assist. And always know, and we should dig deeper in our pocket when contributing because we know it's going to a good cause. And I want you to have confidence in your leadership, at your congregations, and you for 21st Street. You have confidence in the eldership that your resource will be spent in an appropriate way. And this will continue on. First Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, we've already commented earlier about First Corinthians 16, Galatians 6 and 10. This passage is great because it identifies two different groups. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good, number one, to all men, especially, number two, those of the household of faith. Do good to everybody. There's nobody you can do sorry to. You understand? There's nobody you can be rude and not Christian-like to, in or out of the church. Do good to all men, but especially they of the household of faith. You see a distinction once more? In the last three passages of Scripture, it identifies those of the world and those in the church. These are very key elements here. First Timothy 6, chapter, verse 17, verse 18. This is just a direct charge to people who are rich that they not be caught up in their wealth and they'd be willing to help other people. Again, James 2, verse 14 and 17. James, the brother of our Lord, gave an illustration here. And in this illustration, he said, if there comes someone who's naked and they're destitute of daily food and you don't help them, you're not doing your work. You not put your faith into action. The entire area of verses would cover, if you're taking notes, 14, James 2, 14 through 26. This is an illustration to show faith and words work together. 
You put your faith into action. When you see somebody who's naked, they need clothing, they're destitute, they need help, food, clothing, shelter, whatever, that you reach a helping hand to help them, you put your faith into action. But if you just turn a, a blind eye and walk away, your faith did not be put into action. So we need to keep our eyes open, our ears open, and see for opportunity that we can help other people. We should do that because we want to be helpful and nice and generous and polite and kind and thoughtful and man, 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 man. This is huge. This is part of Christian living. So important. All of these verses and many more can be given here. Let me conclude with this. Does God really care about your money? Honestly. God? The Almighty? The one that says, let there be light, but there was light? The one that made a bigger light for the day and a smaller light for the night? That God? Does He really care about your nickel and dimes? Yes. Yes. What He cares about is your heart. He cares about your within. It's one thing, whatever outward appearance you may put on, but he really cares about your heart. That's what he really cares about. He wants to know, are you going to do the right thing? Are you going to give? Now, gradually, nor of necessity, you'll be a cheerful giver. I mean, I could give the same amount you give, and you could have a right attitude, and I could have a wrong attitude. The same money together. Let's see what we find here. Three illustrations, I'll be brief. Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 3 and 8. Would a man rob God? I didn't put my question mark there. I put my question mark. Take some of that. Take some picture of this board. Would a man rob God? There is a conversation. Listen, Malachi is the dynamic book of the Old Testament. I love Malachi. <laughs> said, Would a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. And they said, How have we robbed you, God? He said, In your tithe and in your offerings. Ooh. Ouch. Are you stingy? Have you robbed God in today's time in teaching? Yeah, God cares about your resources as it produces your heart and it shows you who you are from within, not only from without. Number two. The widow's offering, Mark 12, verse 41 through 44. This is really a cool passage right here. You know, it said that Jesus was sitting against a wall watching people cast money into the treasury. That's what he said. He was sitting against a wall. He watched people cast money into the treasury. Does he care? You better believe it. He cares. He wasn't there wasting his time. He cared. He, this w woman gave two mites. All she had. And those who had more of an abundance, King James Version said, they gave of their abundance. And Jesus drew an analogy and said, this woman gave more than they did. No, not more money, but more in percentage of what she had than what they had. They really didn't miss what they gave. But she gave essentially all she had. That's an amazing set of verses that could warrant us to take a good hard look at. You're talking about a wonderful heart this lady had it was fabulous for me and for you. And the fact that Jesus watched people cast money into the treasury, I'll assure you, God and Jesus has an opinion. Number three. Ananias and Sapphira. One of the first problems recorded in Scripture in the New Testament church, Acts 5, 1 through 11. Husband and wife. They were the, a major need for financial resources. People were willing to sell their homes, sell everything, and come lay the money at the apostles' feet so people, they could help other Christian people. That's noble. But it wasn't required to sell everything you had. Please get that. What was not, that wasn't required. People but were willing to help. And not to set fire. They sold. And they, they kept back part of it. And they took the rest of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, you know, this all that you've got? He said, yep, everything we have. They lied. It wasn't wrong for them to keep back part of it. That wasn't a problem. 
what was wrong for them to lie about it. Peter said, why? Why have you lied? You're not lying to me, man. You're lying to God. Yeah, I think God cares. Three hours, and then immediately he dropped dead. He was gone. He lied, he died. Ooh. What would happen if we died if we lied? I'll probably be preaching to an empty building, or you may not even have a preacher. He lied, he died. Three hours later, this is all, every bit of verse 1 through 11. Three hours later, his wife, not knowing that she was a widow, the Bible said not knowing what had happened, she didn't know her husband was dead. She came in, she did the exact same thing. Peter confronted her, and guess what she did? She died. Bang, she's gone. Yeah, God cares. He can get by without the money. The money's not the issue, but the heart really is the issue. Oh, there's so much more I want to say, so much more I could say, but so much more I'm not going to say. You have been extremely patient today. Thank you very much. Thank you for following your Bibles and taking notes and just giving close and undivided attention. If you have questions about the lesson, feel free.